Okay, I'm Ernest Flagg. I, I am uh, with Nursing and Behavioral Health Services and also Flagg and Associates in Michigan. Nursing and Behavioral Health Services is based in Georgia. I also have Frederick on the line and uh, he will be uh, working through this particular video with me and its focus uh, is what every AFC and group home administrator must know and that's that's the focus of this video we will be working through plenty of content we're going to try to keep this video right at about 15 minutes uh, just for the record I hold I am an art registered nurse and I'm also uh, hold a master's in public administration our focus is personal care business development adult foster care homes personal care homes home care and home health agencies and that's what we develop you can access our websites from the links below and also our phone numbers there. You can also sign up for a free consultation on our website. On, the, on either of the websites you're able to uh, access uh, free consultation and um, that's a very helpful service if you want to at some point open up a group home or if you uh, personal care business of any sort. Or you already, if you're already in the midst of opening one or got one open and you got some questions, um, you can sign up for our free consultation and, uh, and, and we'll help you out. Also, uh, on our website are downloadable products uh, so that if you are looking to do this yourself, you, know, you don't have the money to retain a licensing consultants or an expert to help you. Um, in this area, you can you can go to our website and download those products and 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 do hey just mosey on and and uh, you know edit them, tailor them to to your particular program to your particular population, and 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 uh, you know and, and 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 we say good luck you know good luck and make it happen. Frederick, you want to lead in this uh, in this uh, discussion. What what every administrator um, must know. What every AFC home or personal care home administrator must know in running their operations. Roles and responsibilities. You want to take off with that? Yes, that includes uh, six broad areas. The first is planning. And planning primarily answers the question where your organization is and where it wants to be. And that's primarily short range and long range planning. The second major responsibility or category would be organizing, and that primarily involves the administrator achieving all those coordinated efforts among all the elements of the organizational operations and those elements obviously include staffing, financial management, marketing, the residents obviously and their designated representatives, those relevant stakeholders and that's government stakeholders and private stakeholders and also their close community uh, relations. The uh, third general category would be staffing, and the administrator there involves with determining the needs, staffing needs for the organization, recruiting, and screening them, interviewing them. The fourth general area would be directing, and that's where I really call the administrator the quarterback for the team or the leader of the team in the manner that achieves the goals of the organization. I've already mentioned financial man management, controlling, directing the financial management, uh, etc. The fifth general area would be controlling, and that deals with evaluating quality in all the areas and detecting what those potential and actual deviations from the organization's plan and implementing a corrective action program. In other words, we'll put the general category there, quality assurance. And the sixth general area is performing the duties of direct care workers as needed, because sometimes administrator 
may have to assume the role and responsibility that their direct chair of staff has to do. Okay. The other concern, general concern, would be the initial certification and training and medical clearance and background checks. And next would be annual updates that the administrator has to make sure is in place. And hold on for a second, uh, Frederick. I want to just weigh in on that. That initial certification training, uh, a lot of people are um, coming into uh, a lot of the clients we get. I see that they are not aware that they even have to be certified as an administrator uh, before they can file an application. Uh, that they need a year of work experience in that particular area. It, working with that particular population or the population there, they, they have on their program statement or their services program. Um, a lot of people don't know that, that they require that they got have to be certified. I'm shocked though. I'm very shocked though because it's right in the administrative rules and it's laid out on most government websites, you know, most division websites that uh, license for AFC homes or small group homes or personal care homes. Okay. But go ahead. And in connection with the, uh, the administrator is required to maintain annual updates in those uh, particular service areas. And the administrator, since the administrator is the quarterback of the team leader, the administrator is also annually evaluated, and that evaluator should be independent. Okay. And that includes a general snapshot of the administrator. And also I want to add that it is the administrator's responsibility to know the the, the law, Public Act, uh, since we're speaking about, uh, this one will be in the context of, of Michigan, uh, to know Public Act 218 and to know the administrator rules, which it happens to be in the blue book, which, is, which I'm holding up right now. Um, to know these rules in and out well in advance of licensing a home because when the state come to inspect that facility for opening it, they will, that small, so you can that small group home, um, 12 or less uh, residents there, they will be going by this blue book in terms of uh, assessing the home for Readiness is the you know looking at the environment, looking at the rules, the the pop uh, your population uh, that you're going to be serving, coming out to a program statement, looking around the house, uh, uh, evaluating the you know whether or not you got interconnected hardwired smoke detector system, whether or not all the doors, including the storm doors, are non-lock against egress. Um, they will be looking to see if you got the proper uh, smoke detectors, I'm sorry, fire extinguishers on each level of the home. If uh, the bedrooms have, you know, the bed, the dresser, the mirror, the chair, every one of them have uh, those particular items in there. That will be coming from this uh, blue book, all the program elements. If the medications are double locked, if the refrigerator is and freezer have a certain temperature in there and have a uh, temperature gauge in the refrigerator freezer as well, but also if the hot water happens to be a certain temperature, which is necessary, uh, they will be coming from this blue book. So it'll it'll be uh, who of uh, who of you to know the know this book in and out as an administrator, because uh, nobody should know this book better than you in your organization. Nobody, not one person, especially employees. Yeah, another point about that inspection. And this is not getting off the track. If you're just opening up, if the administrator and the licensee, they're just opening up the home, when the inspector comes in, that home should have the appearance that residents are already there. So 
they walk mm -hmm. through. So you're saying the home must it should look like it's ready. You're saying that it should be ready to accept residents. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. How many homes have how many facilities we've been through in Michigan, Georgia, and 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 there we're doing a walkthrough inspection and. Um, you know, they 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 indicate all oh, the inspectors coming in a couple of days. You know, but they they're nowhere near ready. The homes, no food in the house, no three months supply of food, and uh, you know the the hardwired the interconnected the smoke detector system is not hardwired. It's battery driven only, and it's not interconnected. Or they're trying to you know do something slick and. And, and get away with the uh, battery-operated uh, smoke detectors as if the licensing consultant is not going to stand on a chair and unscrew it to see that it's not hardwired. Yes, perfectly. How many? I mean, the number is... Uh, I can't pinpoint it's, it. It's, it's, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with any home that uh, we have uh, done the preparation inspection for where that home was in place. Right. Right. Exactly. I'm not even... And not but... necessarily that they were trying to get away with something, but they just marginalized the importance of that home being exactly the way it should be. But you, you know what? I, I appreciate you really calling me on that, Fred, because I feel... because. But I use that and say get away with because I have in, in a couple of instances, in a couple of and this is not the norm. And you're right, you know, everyone is not like that, and I don't think that's the case. But I'm stuck with a couple of instances recently where I clearly told them that it must be hardwired and move to show the rules and the regs. Show them in, within the rules and the regs where it was defined by the state, mm -hmm. only to come back and see two two people still, you know, risk their inspection um, by leaving them leaving the regular battery operated smoke protector system in place. So, but thank thanks for pulling. You know, let's uh, let's move on. Thanks for pulling my coattail on that. So what's the next area let's look at uh, again this this video is on what every administrator of an AFC home or personal care home must know we're talking about now we are talking about I want to before the next one is pre-admission and admission process but I'm just looking back through to make sure uh, nothing pops into my head um, as an administrator, I think it's relevant to know that if you're just going to be in the administrative facility and have no direct contact with the residents, achieving administrative certification is enough, and but mandatory as well. But if you're going to have direct contact with the residents, it is imperative that you have direct care worker or direct support professional training any direct contact with the residents. Now, it is our position that you have both administrative certification training and direct care worker certification training so that you can work at ground zero. But even if you're not going to work at ground zero with, uh, with other direct care workers, at a minimum, you know the role of a direct care worker, you understand it, well and you can perform in it if necessary if a resident don't show up I'm sorry if uh, an employee does not show up a direct care worker or direct support professional does not show up you can fill in that spot and keep the wheels turning and your business continue you know and I would like to have a book up here they will not show up right 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 exactly so don't be shocked if you called at 10 30 by your second shift staff member at 11 o'clock 
indicating you that the third shift person has not called and the third shift person is not there. You have to get out of your bed and go relieve that staff member if that staff member cannot cover. You will then have to step in and perform the role of a DCW. Yeah, you're the administrator of your facility. You're the administrator. You're the boss of your facility. But now you have to perform the work of uh, a direct care worker, meaning you're going to have to pass, possibly assist with the self-administration of medications, not pass meds. We don't pass meds in Michigan. You assist with the self-administration of medication, and you're going to have to document. You're going to have to document progress notes. And if your name is on those progress notes, the state will see that, and they will wonder you know, they will know, they will wonder if you're trained as a direct care worker or you have that training. Okay, so you keep in mind, and you can get cited for that. So keep in mind, we provide both of those trainings, administrative uh, certification and also direct care worker certification, and we are state approved. So uh, I, I recommend you come through us because our training is extraordinary. It is different very well from many of the agencies out there. Our focus is on not just the psychological or cognitive aspect of populations, but also uh, more of the medically fragile uh, individuals dealing with people who have medical, uh, severe medical issues such as peripheral vascular disease, hypertension, uh, high blood pressure, and, 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 and colostomies traits and we, we help to um, really train staff on how to assess uh, assess residents, assess the individual but all, and to document uh, properly and to document a certain way but also to handle medical emergencies such as elevated blood pressure, elevated blood sugars or low blood pressures, low blood sugars and what to do in uh, crises such as those. So you can get our training, go to our website and sign up for that training at any time and, uh, and uh, we will make it happen. A portion of the training is online and uh, you can also get a uh, on-site training as well. Frederick, you want to go on into the uh, pre-admission process now? Yes, with the pre-admission process, the <clears throat> administrator or designated personnel to conduct pre-admission uh, screening to determine if that resident will fit with the program of services that you have and also fit with the other residents in the home and fit with the facility, the physical facility. And by that I mean if you accept someone who is wheelchair bound, then your home has to meet certain specifications about accessibility. After the pre admission screening, uh, you determine that the person uh, will be admitted and the person wants to live in your home, and be a resident here, then you go through the admission process. And that includes various state forms. In Michigan, we call them decal forms, and also your home forms, specific home forms. I want to add. Nathan's assessment may also be if you have a nurse on staff, an RN on staff, who will conduct that process for you. Or if not, you just have a staff member, typically the site manager, who would conduct that admission process. I want to add that during this pre-admission process, this is the time to really glean all the, all the uh, your goal is to ascertain as much information as you can uh, from the contact person or the person or that guardian about that individual because right now you want to know if this person is a good fit for the, for, for, the, for the home. And this is the time to say no. 
This is the time to really scream and, and find out if this person is a good fit. Because you will have to, this is where you say no, hey man, uh, we can't take them. Because once they're in your home, it's a, it's a bit difficult to get rid of them. There's a process. You got to document proper, a certain way. You got to wait 30, give them a 30 day notice. You know, you got to put up with stuff. So really, you want to make sure you get as much information about this person uh, as possible. And let, let me give you an, let me give you an example. We went to, oh my goodness, just recently we went to, uh, to um, uh, interview a potential placement. When we get there, there's a coordinator there. They're smiling. The home managers, the, the home uh, administrators there, he's just smiling. And both of them are praising this individual. But as I'm gleaning through the medications, as I'm looking through the progress notes, another picture, a totally another picture, is painted of this individual, independent of what the administrator who's trying to get away, get this person out their home, and the coordinator saying. And then I say, well, man, why are you just giving away money? Help me understand. Why are you discharging this individual? And he says, oh, well, I think that he needs, you know, sometimes a change environment is just good, he says. And so, and so I, I ask him, I say, well, okay, well, you, you, he's change of environment, okay. So he says he's improved and done the best he can do here. I said, well, our facility is the same as your facility. You know, you're talking about two linear levels of care. It's the same. I could see if you were advocating for the guy to get him independent living or something uh, of that nature, you know, um, or semi-independent living, you know, but you, you, you're saying he's okay to come to the, another level of care that's consistent with where he is. What's really going on? Then I asked the guy for some incident reports. He, he couldn't find one incident report, not one incident report on the individual. Um, but that I see, but I see all type of behavioral uh, information inside of the progress notes, which would suggest to me that this guy is problematic and the coordinator and he are trying to sugarcoat things, uh, Frederick. So that pre-admission process is the time to get rid of somebody or not accept them or just, just to say no because it's a challenge on the other side of admitting an individual it's a challenge getting a person out of your home uh, very quickly so staffing Frederick you want to take over that one so the general makeup would be your site manager your direct here Staff, a transporter, and that's optional because the site manager may serve as the transporter too, but it depends on how many homes you have. And the fourth general category, fourth general category would be independent contractors as needed. Before you go there, Fred, uh, Frederick, before you go there, can you speak about, since you're talking about staffing, could you throw a piece in there? Can you just kind of elaborate on shifts and um, staffing as it relates to shifts, establishing shifts? Okay, with, um, what I recommend would be three shifts. Monday through Friday, and that's a three forty hour shift. And on the weekend, two shifts, two twelve hour shifts, and those will be your part time staff members. Uh, the reason I say that is because <clears throat> with those two part timers, when a full time uh, staff member is absent. The part-time member can pick up hours to cover for that particular uh, 
staff member. Okay, and um, let me see here. Qualifications and clearance requirements for the administrator, not less than 18 years of age, high school diploma, GED, physical exam done by a doctor, a TB test, which I believe is an annual, annual test, or chest x-ray if you're unable to take a TB test, proof of immunizations, a criminal background check, uh, your criminal background check on you needs to be is done initially and it's done annually. Your physical exam, I want to state again, must be done by a doctor and it is also annual. And you need 16 CEUs of 16 hours of training in advance of filing your application to the state. 16 CEUs of training. I say, I keep I keep stressing that, that you know this this again this is what every AFC um, or personal care home or group home administrator must know, and so I'm stressing that yes we provide the training yes we are state approved yes we're going over rules and regs so that you will know uh, we're giving this information to you based off of rules and regs so you will know what you need to do as an administrator but also the things that you need to acquire um, as an administrator as well. Uh, new hire training, Frederick. Yeah. Going back to those qualifications and clearance requirements, mm -hmm. those are the same clearance qualifications. I mean, the same qualifications that you listed and mm -hmm. clearance requirements are also for your direct care staff. They have to have those same general qualifications. The new hire training, when you bring in a new staff member, an orientation should be given, an orientation training should be given for that staff member, those staff members, before they have direct contact with residents. So what they're really doing is also using, in addition to that training, in-service training, would be mentoring, where they are shadowing that site manager throughout the shift. And in Michigan, I think they give you, I think it's a 30 day period when they should receive their direct care training, first aid certification, CPR certification, and their recipient right certification. And after that's completed, that staff member, newly hired staff member, assumes the duties and responsibilities of a direct care work. Okay. The direct care workers are also annually uh, evaluated. The administrator is responsible for that task and also the administrator is responsible for doing the review, employee audit, to make sure that all documents that should be in that file are there okay. and current. Uh, staff members, director of staff members, also must satisfy the requirement of annual updates and. In addition, the organization should hold quarterly in-service staff training and development to make sure that the staff are on target. For example, if your organization decides to admit an AD resident, and your organization has received approval for that, permission for that, then your staff should receive training on AD Alzheimer's disease. So the date should be addressed to that particular resident and helping that resident achieve their service goals and objectives. 
Frederick, for time eight. purposes, can you advance on to eight, nine, and I'll pick up at ten? Okay. Record review. Resident record review. Resident right? record review. Yeah, resident record review. That's done monthly. And just like the audit is done on employees and the record review of the resident, a record review of the resident should be done monthly by the administrator to make sure all documents are in the file, they're current, and correct. Right, right, right. Just like the, just like the annual physicals for employees, a medical clearance, the same should be for residents, and also there should be an annual update of their residence assessment plan to make sure that you're meeting those uh, needs of the residents. So it's assessed every year, it's updated. The other area you asked me to cover is what? Um, did you do the did you cover 10, I'm sorry, 9 with mandatory reporting? Yeah, the mandatory reporting by the state would be incident accident reports. And they should be submitted to the state, your licensing consultant, which within 24 hours of the incident. And the other general category would be documentation per shift. And that covers uh, a myriad of uh, areas. Absolutely. absolutely. Uh, you're documenting on medications. You're documenting on observed behaviors. You're documenting on the self-administration of medications. You're documenting on monitoring activities. Say if this individual uh, happens to have seizure activity or uh, peripheral vascular disease, shortness of breath, uh, you know, you're, you're taking blood pressure or blood sugar. Uh, readings uh, daily, excuse me, this individual goes on a community outing, all of that information is to be documented and uh, in, in the progress notes to demonstrate your, you know, just demonstrate what you're doing. Um, you have a behavior, so you're documenting on the behavior, um, you're documenting on the um, intervention, you're documenting on the outcome, what did the resident do or individual do after you redirected them or you gave them that, that, um, that juice because of the low blood sugar, how did they respond? So uh, keep in mind that what you're doing is interventions, 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 and you're documenting on these interventions and these monitoring activities. So as Frederick indicated, the documentation piece is, is extremely broad. We could turn that documentation this documentation conversation into an eight-hour discussion uh, right now. It's just we don't have the time for that. But just know that your documentation occurs every shift. And in many instances, some of these agencies can take back uh, funds if you don't document a certain way. So uh, make sure that your documentation is meaningful and it's relevant. It's relevant, it's meaningful, uh, and it's, it's connected to the the resident that that's uh, of issue here or uh, at hand. Medication. I like your phrasing. I like your phrasing when you say, it. if, you, "If it's not documented, it didn't happen." I like that phrasing. It go it go a long way. Uh, you can't make it up uh, after the fact. You can't uh, just say it occurred after the fact. And definitely in the court of law, uh, that's going to be the the philosophy that uh, uh, Jeffrey Figer or one of these uh, high end. Uh, uh, the attorneys are going to take. I mean, you you know, if it didn't, if it wasn't written, it didn't happen. You know, you didn't document and it, didn't hurt, it didn't happen. There's another uh, term here. All documentation, those are legal documents. So that shows you, stresses the importance of it. It's a document. It is a, um, it's a document of, it's a record of what, occurred and what did not occur. Yeah. 
another critical area for, uh, I want to say, administrators to be aware of and to have a, a good grasp of the process uh, is medication management. And this is a health and safety uh, matter in all facilities, and the state will treat it as that. It is a critical area. Uh, it includes the medication administration record, which is simply a document that uh, is used to record the medications, uh, the regimen, dosage, the, uh, and the uh, specific resident's name, when those medications were administered, if they were not, if the individual was on the leave of absence, uh, side effects, you know. So the MAR happens to be a legal document in and of itself, and any abbreviations on there need to be written in your medication policy. You can't just make up something, that, you know, an abbreviation on the MAR, J for jail. Um, you can't do that. So it has to be, any abbreviations have to be pre-approved and can come from directly from your policies and be presented as a label on the MAR. I want to say, or the medication administration record. So I, can, I should be able to look down at this ledger uh, that's labeled on this MAR and see that J equals jail, if that be the case, or LOA you know, for leave of absence, and those are approved abbreviations I can use. I can't just, as an employee, make up uh, abbreviations and put them on the MAR. The other thing I want to speak about that MAR is that any signature on that MAR or any initials, any initials on that MAR must have an accompanying signature with initials next to it at the bottom. If you have a signature on the MAR, you must also put your initials. You cannot have initials on the MAR and no signature violation. Any medications written on the MAR must be written, must be, any medications transcribed to the MAR must be written on that MAR exactly as they appear on the uh, medication vial or blister pack or bottle. Just, it must be exact. Nothing missing, nothing spelled differently, nothing Omit it, nothing. It's got to be an exact match from the script to the blister pack to the MAR or you as an administrator, you're going to have a problem with the state. There can't be any holes on the MAR when the state comes in. That means the medication wasn't given. Any blank spots on the MAR means the medication wasn't given. That's how they're going to interpret it. If your signatures on the MAR, your initials are in the MAR, in one of the spots, that means that medication was given. That's how it's going to be interpreted. No him and how and accepted. And you want to understand this and master that. Master what I'm trying to say. Get a good grip of this. The state does not play when it comes to medications or ancillaries related to medications. So you must understand fully and you must inspect those MARs every week. Medication store, you must inspect, I want to go back, you must inspect those MARs every week. For what, Frederick? Why are they inspecting those MARs? Because I want to mash down on this because this MAR thing is taking, can take you out of this game. It can take you out of this industry. I'm sorry. Missing signatures. Discontinued medications can't be on the MAR. Discontinued medications can't even be in the home. Uh, you know, you can't scratch out or draw through something. You can't add stuff on with a pen. The only person can really do that is a nurse. Medication storage. Medications are to be stored a certain way in the home on the double lock. If they're, you're transporting medications, they need to be double locked when, when transporting them. Medication disposals must be handled a certain way. You cannot flush meds down the toilet. If you return them, you're going to return them to the pharmacy or you're going to have a biohazard container. Uh, in the home with a biohazard contract available to show the state that we send these medications back. 
If you're sending medications back, they're not used, they're disposed of, they're being taken out for a reason because either they were dis discontinued, you dropped them on the floor, the resident refused, you must have a document to show that this medication was held or is being sent back or fell on the floor. You must document that. Every pill. Medications, medication errors are handled a certain way. And you must have a process for handling medication errors written in your medication administration policy. Medications for residents when they're on the leave of absence must be handled a certain way. Scripts are handled a certain way. Scripts must be reviewed to make sure the medications are relevant. To make sure that the medications, they're a new medication. You got a script in your hand, you're going to ask that doctor right then, is there any changes in these medications? Are there any new medications added? You're going to make sure that these medications are the same before you walk away from the doctor's office. That's the time when you're on site to challenge the scripts that are in your hand. Are medications on the script? Did he use a script to simply write an order? Or to write follow-up visit on there? Lab results are handled a certain way. Lab results must be looked at immediately. Depending on how those lab results came into your possession, you may have to fax them to the doctor. Those lab results can be mean life or death. And one of those lab results could say that the dilatin level is twice the limit for your, it's, it's, it's two times high for the resident, which means, oh my goodness, I got to do something about this lab result. You can't just take lab results, scripts, and just throw them to the side. Scripts, if the medications are on there, need to be filled that day, and that resident need to be taking those medicines that day. That means the, there needs to be adjustments made on the MAR right then, at that time. Not tomorrow, not next week, not next year. That medic, if there's a new med, it needs to be added on the MAR, and the resident needs to be get, need to get that medication that day, within hours of that script. And documentation needs to be done all the time when there's storage, disposal, errors, new meds. You, you, documentation is always a factor. You must create a record of what you're doing. You must create a record of what you're doing because again, down the line, if it's not wrote, if it's, if it's, if it's not wrote anywhere, if, it, if it's not written, it didn't happen. It, 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 it didn't happen, it didn't happen, it didn't happen, and you're not gonna have opportunity uh, when the state come in or you end up in court, uh, you're not going to have an opportunity to try to recollect uh, what happened. You're not, first thing, you're not going to be able to do it, and uh, that's going to play against you. I promise you, in the eyes of state, Medicaid, Medicare, insurance companies, you know, court, the law is not going to work out. So you need to monitor your uh, medications and all of, its, all of it, the related processes associated with the medications uh, need to be looked at closely and it need to be looked at weekly because it's so intricate you can't let it get away from you you cannot let it get away from you you cannot let yeah. it get away from you two other areas in documentation would be medication weekly medication audit mm -hmm. along with non control uh, medication and then daily per shift for your control of narcotics. Right. How this should be done. So there so, should be two staff members there. Also an audit is done when the medication is delivered. An audit should be done. Absolutely. Absolutely. And audit should be done at the end of the month when new meds come in and the MARs now have to be uh, uh, re recreated for the subsequent of the new month. An audit must be done. So, Frederick, we're going to conclude this uh, video. This is what every administrator uh, must know. We'll just add this little, just add this footnote. Go ahead. Because the state does this too. When the state comes in, they're looking at the MAR. They want to see all the medications. You bring them out. They count the medications. So that means if you have 15 medications, uh, 15 uh, pills 
now, medications now. And only five days had passed since that prescription was given, you're in trouble. <laughs> exactly. And uh, you're exactly. And, 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 and for every medication you got in that house, you better have a script for it. I don't care if it's an over-the-counter medication. You need to have a standing order for that. If you're managing that, those meds in a group home, you need a list of standing order meds, Maalox, uh, 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 oh my goodness, uh, Tums or Mylanta, uh, regular aspirins for headache and pain and something for sores and minor cuts. You need to have a fish oil. <laughs> right. 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 You need standing orders to have those meds there. And you need, you need a script for every medication. And if it's 10 scripts, it better be 10 meds. If it's 9 scripts, it better be 9 meds in there when they come. You know, if a medicine was DC'd, it better be gone. It better be DC'd. And that DC date on the MAR better match the DC date on the script. So if you got some creativity to do, you need to handle your business and keep your records right. Because the health and safety of the residents you're dealing with is number one, should be number one. And uh, definitely, you know, you don't, you, you need to make it number one every week. You don't want to make it number one when the state get in because they're going to help. You don't want the state to make it, you know, make it number one fake. You want to, for you, I'm sorry, you want to make it number one weekly because when the state get there, it's going to be number one. And some of the stuff they say might surprise you. I'm serious. Some of the stuff they say might surprise you. I'm telling you, you better do a background check on. You talked about employee records. You better do a background check on every employee. You better have every document. You better uh, in, in all the documents for those employees you bring in need to be current. You need to show that you verified their references. Uh, you know that you have all the regular reg, relevant uh, employee documents. They got an application and it's signed. You know. Um, you got their credentials, if they're claiming a degree or certain education, you need to have the, the copies of that stuff to show that you have verified this with this individual. You, you, you know, before you brought this individual into the company of the residents because, you know, because, I mean, the health and safety of the residents happens to be number one in this industry and it should be number one. If you are running a group home, if you're running a personal care home, it should be number one uh, to you as well. Frederick, we're going to conclude here. You're okay with that? And we'll pick up on health and safety issues in uh, another uh, in another video, okay? Absolutely. All right. You have a good day, and uh, thank you, Frederick. And uh, our links are below. Yeah, to get to our websites and you definitely can uh, give us a call, set up a phone consultation and uh, again we license in all states and we're certified trainers so uh, and I'm a registered nurse as well and I, we enjoy what we do so have a good day.